long day. Uh, and this is the last panel uh, of the conference. And in fact, it's going to be longer than the others uh, because we are going to both do the panel and have a discussion period after the panelists have spoken and then shift into closing discussion ah. and invite people to talk not just about the panel, but about everything that we've done. Uh, what did we name this panel? <laughs> Addressing effects of populism. <laughs> as, if, as if we hadn't been as addressing as if we effects. Hadn't been doing that. <laughs> So it's my great pleasure to introduce here, uh, not to my far right, uh, but to the far right of the bench, uh, Jeremy Waldron, uh, who is university professor at NYU School of Law and the author of numerous well-known books on jurisprudence and political theory. Uh, to his physical left, uh, Michael Posner, who is the Jerome Kohlberg Professor of Ethics and Finance at NYU's Stern School of Business, uh, after serving as Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau, for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, uh, in other words, uh, the person with the leading human rights responsibility in the State Department, um, after all the other things he's done for human rights uh, in his career. Uh, and then T. Alexander Olenikov, who is uh, now university professor at the Milano School of International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy at the New School, uh, returning uh, to academia at last uh, after his recent service as UN Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees uh, in Geneva. Uh, they're going to speak in the order in which uh, I introduce them. Um, and they're going to, I take it, address the effects of populism. <laughs> All right, thank you, um, Dana, thank you, Emily, thank you, Jerry, for organizing this conference and for inviting me. In the uh, written paper I submitted, and in my original intention, I, I plan to talk about a subset of human rights, namely rights concerned with due process, fair trial, um, uh, detention, and so on, sort of rule of law rights, uh, procedural rule of law rights and a subset of populism, which was mainly focused on populism in the United Kingdom, where um, the Human Rights Act is sometimes described as a, a charter for criminals or a villain's charter. <clears throat> and I'm going to say quite a bit about that, but mostly what I want to do is proceed in the spirit of a remark I made during the first panel this morning, which is that we are here, we are gathered here today not just to describe the many evils and abuses of populism, but in a sense to also to try to strain to listen whether there's anything to be learned from the populist critique of human rights. Because as I said this morning, human rights, both institutionally, doctrinally, philosophically, remains a work in progress, remains something that we are still trying to perfect, st still trying to figure out parts of it. We can't assume, we shouldn't assume, complacently that it's perfectly all right and all the problems are located on the populist side of this equation. It's conceivable that populist politics has something to teach us about human rights, or at least we should listen to what is said and uh, give some consideration to it. So without wanting to um, accept every criticism that is made, it did seem to me that we should be um, alert not only to the risks posed by populism but to the benefits that might come from the willingness of the populists to speak truth to the human rights establishment. So that's the way I want to proceed. Now, as I said, the context of proceeding is going to be uh, particularly uh, focused on populism in Great Britain and in the views of those who in the recent past have described the European Convention on Human Rights and its statutory embodiment in the UK's Human Rights Act as a charter for criminals, those who associate human rights in general with foreign imposition, and those who have demanded, and I do want to talk about this at some length, who have demanded the enactment of something they call a British Bill of Rights, 
which is supposed to be somehow different both from the Human Rights Act and from the European, and from the European Convention. The, um, the description of the Human Rights Act as a charter for criminals, I first heard it very disconcertingly from a colleague at All Souls when I was there uh, three or four years ago. It's an entirely liberal and decent person who just said when, when the Human Rights Act was mentioned, she said, it's a charter for criminals. Um, and she was perhaps echoing the, um, something that was said in the Daily Mail. You know that, that, that old uh, joke, if I, wanted to, if I wanted your opinion, I'd read the Daily Mail. But, but um, <laughs> in 2012, the Mail on Sunday ventured the opinion that it's time the Convention on Human Rights was made to work as originally intended, rather than as a charter for criminals and parasites. And above all, the human rights of the indigenous population must be considered, which doesn't refer to sort of um, first peoples, but just refers to uh, regular uh, <coughs> white Britons, as far as we can tell. The human rights of the indigenous population must be considered. Do these rights not safeguard them from having da dangerous rapists placed in their midst? If they do not, then they are not worth having, and we would be better off without them. That's the Mail on Sunday in 2012. We're told that the human rights culture is creating an increasingly dangerous Britain where the bullies are guarded by the state, where common sense has disappeared, and where anarchy triumphs over order. Even Jack Straw, who was the Labour uh, Home Secretary who piloted the Human Rights Act through Parliament, said there is a sense that it's a villain's charter. And a few years ago, in submissions to the House of Lords Committee, which was considering the possibility of enacting a British Bill of Rights, a government mm -hmm. spokesman said that, to the government's regret, human rights have acquired a bad name in the public s square. Human rights have become associated with unmeritorious uh, individuals pursuing through the courts claims that do not command public support or uh, sympathy. And I'm afraid that sort of sentiment, very common, still remains quite common in, in Great Britain and has been a focus of... <laughs> um, has been a focus of um, populist discontent. Some of this discontent has to do with features that are genuinely disturbing. That is the blocking of deportation of foreign offenders, convicted foreign offenders, on the grounds that such deportation would disrupt their family life through an appeal to Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights about respect for family life. Some of it has been on issues that are seen as uh, offensive to British sensibilities, such as the instruction by the European Court of Human Rights, in the case of Hearst, to uh, secure some possibility of prisoners voting in general elections. For years it had been assumed, and it was laid down peremptorily in statute law, that prisoners do not vote during the time of their detention, and the mm -hmm. European Court of Human Rights had insisted that the British government needed to revisit that and uh, secure voting rights for prisoners, or at least for some prisoners. David Cameron, who himself is not necessarily a populist but is not above appealing to populist sensibilities, said the prospect of prisoners voting pursuant to this decision made him physically ill, and his nausea was echoed, if nausea can be echoed, um, <laughs> by his by his <coughs> colleagues in Parliament who immediately passed, by some overwhelming majority, a, um, a non-binding resolution rejecting the idea of legislation to enable prisoner voting. And it was one of the very few standoffs that there have been between the European Court of Human Rights, whose decision the government of Great Britain is treaty-bound to implement, a uh, standoff between the European Court and the, and the British government, resolved only recently with some non-statutory adjustment to allow a tiny handful of convicted prisoners uh, to, vote, to vote in um, elections. Now, part of this concern, part of what is driving the concern about the Human Rights Act and about these doctrines is some sense that these doctrines are foreign to British common sense, that these doctrines are um, the result of uh, funny foreigners coming up with far-fetched doctrines and then imposing them on the decent yeomen and yeowomen of England uh, who have their own Dicean traditions of the rule of law which uh, embody uh, common sense uh, arrangements. 
and then those are being upended either by Article 8 of the Convention or by this, this uh, strange, strange doctrine of uh, prisoner voting. You find this antipathy to foreign imposition sometimes in the United States as well. You remember Justice Thomas talking about rejecting foreign fads and fashions when somebody, uh, when I think uh, Justice Breyer had suggested uh, introducing the doctrine of the death row syndrome into, into uh, American jurisprudence. So that notion of foreign imposition, I think, is important in, in understanding this, and it's one of the things that we have to confront. And we know that there is also concern um, in Britain about the, the institutional source of these impositions, that these impositions are done by courts, unelected judges, uh, trying to frustrate the will of parliament on things like uh, prisoner voting. Um, it's uh, a sense, of, it's a resentment of policy making by judges in areas like criminal procedure where it is felt that the will of the people as represented in parliament ought to prevail. There's some sense that, look, there are important issues outstanding in our thinking about criminal justice, in our thinking about due process, in our thinking about fair trials and detentions. There are some issues outstanding on which the community as a whole divides into majorities and minorities and in which any political institution dealing with it is going to decide by majorities and minorities. And do we want this matter decided for us by majority decision-making among judges or majority decision-making <coughs> among elected legislatures? And as my remarks in the previous panel indicate, I have some sympathy uh, for, the, for, for, that, for that question. If you're going to count heads, why not count elected heads rather than judicial wigs? Um, but at the same time, and it's worth noting that some of the support for the idea of a distinctively British Bill of Rights is based on the proposition that if we're going to have rights imposed by courts, then it's better to have them imposed by British courts acting on the basis of British common sense and British jurisprudence rather than by courts in Strasbourg acting on the basis of doctrines that have been cooked up in, in, in continental Europe. So some of the, 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 the case that was made for a distinctive British Bill of Rights in the Conservative Party manifesto of 2015 was in part that it would break the formal link between British courts and the European Court of Human Rights, allowing British courts to operate independently and make the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom into the ultimate arbiter of human rights matters in the United Kingdom. And all of this, as you know, is echoing some concern about judicial authority uh, in the United States, although the debate in Britain uh, about the counter-majoritarian difficulty is less advanced uh, there than it is than it is here. Now, the, um, the call for a distinctively British Bill of Rights, as I said, it's been circulating for a while in civil society organizations. In 2015, the Conservative Manifesto promised to scrap the Human Rights Act and introduce a British Bill of Rights. It, would, it wouldn't be the Bill of Rights of 1689, from which our language about cruel and unusual punishment is drawn. It wouldn't be the Human Rights Act, which is simply a echo of the European Convention. It would be something that would protect the basic rights that decent Englishmen think are important. Uh, it would reverse, this is again the language of the Conservative Manifesto, reverse the mission creep that has meant human rights law being used for more and more purposes and often with little regard for the rights of wider society. It will stop terrorists and other serious foreign criminals who pose a threat to our society to our society from using spurious human rights arguments to prevent deportation. And the Secretary of State is on record as saying that the government's, this I guess was Theresa May at the time, that the government's two main objectives in introducing a British Bill of Rights were to restore national faith in human rights and to give human rights greater national identity. Now you should know that, that as of now, the proposal to enact a specifically British Bill of Rights and to repeal the Human Rights Act and to distance the British polity from the Strasbourg system and the Council of Europe uh, has been put on hold with the British government feeling that it's got its work cut out with Brexit uh, and withdrawing from the EU and one constitutional crisis at a time is probably uh, uh, perfectly, perfectly um, enough. There's even a taste of originalism in the resentment. There's some sense that we helped draft the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, 
40, 50 years ago, and it has deviated from its original intent to draw in these, 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 these concerns. So all of this is going on, and as I said, my aim in, in, um, in bringing it up is to, is to consider whether anything can be said in favour of these suggestions that off the top of one's head sound like pandering to populist antipathy towards human rights. I'm as concerned as anybody else about Britain's withdrawal from the, the Council of Europe system. I'm concerned partly for the reasons that Jerry Newman indicated in the last panel, that you can't tear uh, Britain out of the European Convention on Human Rights without letting an awful lot of other pages flutter to the floor as well. This, is, this would damage a system, not just, not just wreck this particular connection. But in principle, it's worth saying that there's nothing wrong Nothing wrong in principle with the idea of a national legal system setting out its own understanding of fundamental rights independently of what is done in other legal systems or what is done under regional umbrellas like the Council of Europe. Some sort of legal autarky on human rights is not in itself offensive, not something to oppose in principle. It was appropriate for South Africa in the 1990s to respond to its own history and its own experience with its own Bill of Rights. It was appropriate for Canada to formulate its own charter of fundamental rights and freedoms and to develop a jurisprudence that would evince some caution about following US doctrinal uh, developments. And the United States, we know, developed a Bill of Rights for itself in 1791, whose terms are quite different from the, the Bills of Rights that other communities have and from international, international documents. So it's, it's, it's not inappropriate, I think, for nations to have and appropriate for themselves some sense of the, the, the rights that they regard as important in their own traditions. True, it's important for them also to respect their treaty obligations <coughs> under the international covenants uh, and the, the, uh, the various conventions. Um, and true also that uh, nations inevitably and quite properly draw on each other's experiences in regards to contents, formulations, and even, even doctrine. But the notion that we should regard the Council of Europe system as in and of itself normative for any uh, commitment to human rights, I think, needs to be possibly, possibly examined. And I say that very reluctantly because I, of course, don't trust the motives of those who want to enact a British Bill of Rights. But the very idea of a British Bill of Rights is not, is not itself um, particularly offensive. On other concerns about human rights expressed by the populace and this in the spirit of trying to listen to hear whether there's anything worth considering in, in these concerns. One of the concerns that I hear very commonly, there's a new book just recently been published by another former All Souls colleague of mine, Sir Noel Malcolm, called Human Rights and Political Wrongs, A New Approach to Human Rights Law, is that we are increasingly moving away from the idea that human rights represent moral minimums, moral minima, minimum standards for, for, uh, uh, for, for statecraft and, and state dealing. The complaint is sometimes heard that uh, rights advocates have abandoned the idea that rights are moral minima and that they are not supposed to represent the whole of political and social morality but only the most basic requirements necessary for decent treatment of people by their governments. When people talk about moral minima, they often refer to, torture, to the prohibition on torture and in human treatment as, um, as uh, a clear example. There is some justice to this complaint, but I think we have to be careful how we understand moral minima. A number of people have expressed the opinion that simply having a, a more and more expansive notion of human rights while we are, as it were, on a roll institutionally um, is probably a bad idea there is some justice to this complaint, but we have to be careful how we understand moral minima. From one point of view, we list mm. the worst horrors, barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind in the words of the UDHR preamble, like torture and slavery, and we say that the function of human rights is to protect people from these. But in other areas, and particularly the areas that I'm interested in in these remarks, the, the due process area, the uh, fair trial area, the detention area, we have to accept that we're not just laying down certain moral minima, but we're defining a system, a system of rights that is intended to work as a system, 
and particular items in that system may not seem like minimum requirements in and of themselves, but it is a minimum requirement that we um, that we have. Uh, thank you. That we have uh, uh, a system of this sort. I would be open, secondly, to the idea of paying attention to the possibility that rights can be abused and may be developing from some formal doctrine of abuse of rights. We have some elements, rudiments of such doctrine present already in the notion of using your rights as a way of attacking the rights of others. But it seems conceivable that we could develop a notion of abuse of rights uh, and, and some doctrines surrounding them. I think this is connected with a sense that we need to cultivate a stronger connection between human rights and responsibilities. Um, or at least, again, I would not want to be un implacably hostile to that suggestion when it's made by the more articulate members of um, uh, populist movements. The call for an equal emphasis on responsibilities can mean something like responsibility as the content of a right. So parental rights are at the same time parental responsibilities. Responsibility in the way that one exercises one's rights, which goes back to this point about um, uh, abusive rights. Responsibility in regard to the rights of others. Responsibility, taking responsibility for the integrity of the whole system of rights and the responsibilities, whether associated with rights or not, that make the life of a community possible and bearable. I think it's incumbent on human rights advocates to give some thoughts to these matters, even if they suspect the motives of those who want to enact a bill of responsibility. But it's important for us to make sure that we articulate our doctrine of human rights with social responsibilities in mind. And finally, we do need to go back, and the populists are not wrong to insist on this, from time to time to re-examine whatever question of balance there is between the rights of uh, those who are suspected of crimes or who are convicted of crimes and the rights of the rest of the community. Again, we need to be careful about this because our sense of the proper rights of suspects and the proper rights of convicts is not in the first instance a balance. It's rather something that looks at the inherent situation that a particular person suspected of a crime is, is um, subject to. Um, but still, we have to envision a couple of dystopias that seem to be uh, worrying people. One is a, a world in which suspects are peremptorily detained and punished or beaten uh, uh, without due process. And this is the, the dystopia that worries us in our enthusiasm for due process rights. But the other is the dystopia that the populists are mentioning in their literature, which is a dystopia of bullies allowing, being allowed to roam free in the community and ordinary um, law-abiding citizens not being protected from their violence or intimidation. And as we think about particular contentious issues in the field of human rights, I think it, it, it behoves us to pay some attention to the, the, the uh, imagery of um, rights abuses and rights dystopias that are being put forward um, uh, by these advocates. So what I'm emphasizing, I think, just, just, just to sum up and finish, is not that the populists are necessarily right about these issues, but that there is something to listen for in these critiques. And it would be, I think, quite wrong for us to simply say, because they're populists, and because they are therefore hostile to human rights as such, we have no lessons to learn from them. It's an open question whether we have lessons to learn in the area of human rights, because there are issues outstanding in the theory of human rights, and there are, there are controversies that need to be resolved in the theory of human rights, and we need to think, get whatever information we can get from whatever source in the resolution of those issues. Thanks very much indeed. <coughs> Uh, so, um, first of all, Jerry, thank you and, and everybody uh, at Harvard for organizing uh, this meeting. It's a great meeting. I want to pick up in a, in, a, in a sense from what Jeremy's been talking about, and uh, I want to do a couple of things. I'm going to just say a few words about a, some of the things I've heard yesterday and today um, that sort of gave me pause or that I think have to be discuss further as, as we move forward with this, some of the 
uh, diagnosis of what the problem is. And then I want to focus in quite quickly on three things where I think we need to be doing more in the spirit of what Jeremy says, not necessarily adopting a populist critique or, or approach, but recognizing some of the underlying things that are going on that's fueling this movement and some things we can be doing. So just a couple of things uh, in terms of what I've heard. Um, it's been really striking to me how many different ways people have defined the term. Um, and it reminds me, I, this is not a legal term, populism, but it reminds me of the discussions about terrorism. I was years ago at a meeting, a UN meeting, uh, discussing um, the UN efforts to combat terrorism. They had set up a committee in the Security Council. And I sat there for the day, and I was on the last panel. I was sitting with the Spanish ambassador. And I said, you know, if somebody came in from Mars and they heard us talking all day and nobody's ever defined the term, they might wonder what we're doing here. And he said to me, you have to understand, terrorism is such an important concept, we can't commit it to a, a definition. <laughs> so I think we're in, we in some ways need to be, you know, we don't need to have legal precision, but we need to at least be talking about more or less the same thing. And I heard lots of different interpretations here, which suggests we've got some work to do. The second thing that was really striking to me, and, and I think uh, Richard uh, highlighted this this morning, there's different kinds of populism that are occurring in the US or the UK, let's say, and that which is occurring in the Philippines or maybe in, in Turkey. Uh, in the more developed states, in, in the US, UK, and countries like ours, um, there's a huge element of economic dislocation. There's a tremendous division based on immigration status, xenophobia, I would say race. We haven't talked enough about race and racism, but it's a huge underlying uh, piece of this. And then there's a political disempowerment that's going on. Um, as as uh, Richard pointed out, in the Philippines, it's not about economy. The economy is doing quite well. It's this notion of embracing the strong man and the, uh, as an element of responding to an erosion of democracy more broadly. Those are really different things that are going on. It's important that we recognize that. Third thing that struck me, and it was really true, uh, it, it came up pretty strongly in the discussion of Latin America. And there were differences of view in the last couple of days about whether there's populism of the left, populism of the right. I think it was, again, um, Richard, who had uh, four points of what a populist is, rejecting of the rule of law, demonizing political opposition, tolerance of violence, and readiness to reject civil liberties. Chavez from the left does all of those things. And it's striking that there is a difference in the way human rights groups in Latin America reject it to populism of the left. We need to be, if we're going to get at this, we have to do it in a totally principled way. And whatever the origins or rhetoric is, if the, whatever, again, whatever our definition is, if somebody embodies that, we have to be ready to go at it in a, in a principled way. And then finally, to Jeremy's point about foreign imposition, I would just say for, for the American lawyers and Americans in the room, uh, it's important to remember that um, we, in 1953 or 1954, there was a US senator by the name of Bricker uh, who introduced a constitutional amendment to say that we should not ever have a human rights treaty as part of US law. It took President Eisenhower to basically under, uh, cut that off by saying we will never embrace a human rights treaty in the United States. And it took President Reagan in the 80s to lead the charge for the uh, uh, US uh, uh, ratification of the Genocide Convention, which broke the back of this. So there's a long, complicated history. People in the United States feel we're city on a hill. We keep saying that to ourselves. It's Democrats and Republicans. It's very, very deep in this society. Having said that, again, going to this notion of foreign imposition, which Jeremy talked about, which Jerry talked about, the premise of human rights is that it starts with national implementation and national institutions being strong. Uh, notions of complementarity say you, you follow national law where it's working, and if not, then you go to the regional, and then you go to the international. 
we ought to be re we ought to be strengthening national legal systems. That's the first priority. Change on human rights occurs from within, and to the extent that you've got these extra uh, national remedies, that's a suggestion of a failure of the national state and national institutions. We ought to be mindful of that and constantly repeating that rather than fighting that issue. It doesn't mean that the national systems are always working. Clearly, they're not. But we ought to be trying to make that the priority. So here's a couple of, I, I, there are three things I want to just talk about very quickly. One, we've spent a lot of time here, understandably, this is, we're at a law school, there are a lot of lawyers in the room. We talk a lot about civil and political rights. Um, if you look at populism, at least in the United States, as I see it and as I uh, understand it, a lot of it is tied to economic dislocation and a sense of inequality. That inequality is fueled by better and, and really ubiquitous information which is coming at people. The gap between rich and poor is more obvious in our own societies as well as around the world. Um, in the United States, the top 1% of the population uh, has the equivalent uh, income to the 20% uh, 20 uh, has 20% of the income. Uh, in 1950, it was 10%. Um, people uh, on the bottom, 50% uh, of the United States get to have 13% of the income. Um, and so people, and, and this has played out globally, although ironically, what's happened globally is that there's greater wealth and greater reduction of poverty. If you look at uh, the global trends since 1980, um, there's been an enormous reduction in global poverty, which is a human rights issue, but we don't claim it. Uh, I teach now in a business school, and maybe I'm focused on these issues because of that, but in 1980, half the world's population, 2 billion people were living below the poverty level of $1.25 a day. 77% of the people in East Asia. Now it's less than 10% of the people in East Asia living below the poverty level. That is a fantastic achievement for human rights, we ought to own it, and we ought to be thinking about what, what are the consequences in our own societies, and how do we take that on as a human rights agenda, not tied necessarily to courts and traditional human rights tactics, but to recognize that that's part of what's going on here. We shouldn't run away from it. We should endorse it and embrace it. When a candidate is elected because he says, the Chinese and the Mexicans are taking away our jobs. We have to build a wall. We have to have an answer to that other than we're also against TPP. It's simply not, it's not real. People don't believe it. And we're not in any way responding to what's really fueling, an element that's fueling this uh, social upheaval. I tried, I gave a speech. I, I was going crazy when I was in the State Department at the notion that we would go to the UN Human Rights Council and we would say the Cubans would introduce a resolution on maternal mortality and we would vote no but. And people in the legal office in the State Department would say, well, we don't really believe in, you know, we don't have a policy believing in economic and social rights. And I said, that is absolutely ridiculous. Um, certainly since the New Deal, we've been doing all sorts of things that are economic and social rights. Why don't we own up to that? We are not against programs that deal with maternal mortality. Let's go from no but to yes but. And Jim Steinberg, who was the deputy secretary, sort of laughed at me and he said, okay, why don't you give a speech on that? So I decided to give a speech at the 70th anniversary of the Four Freedoms. Um, and I took months to get it cleared. 30 different agencies of the government took a crack at it. But we, I wound up giving a speech saying that economic and social rights are rights according to the US government. I gave it at the ASIL, I think in 2010 or 11. I shouldn't have had to work so hard to do the obvious. And I think rights people in this country ought to be thinking in a smart way, in a practical way, not in a, a rhetorical way, how do we embrace that agenda and come up with affirmative policies? Secondly, and Alex is going to talk about this, but on the issue of immigration and xenophobia and racism, all of that, one of the things that is very striking in the world is that we are, the United States, because of our constitutional free speech tradition, has, is at one end of a spectrum that says 
promoting discrimination, promoting uh, hostility um, is okay because good speech will trump bad speech. That's what Brandeis said. I used to believe that. I'm going to talk about how the internet has changed that. I'm a little, I'm a little weak on that now. And I'm also mindful of the fact that the rest of the world and the UN human rights uh, regime through the Covenant, Article 20 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights says there are two rights in conflict. Speech is on one side. On the other side is speech that's divisive. And so uh, uh, speech that incites hostility, discrimination, as well as violence is prohibited by Article 20. We at least have to think about that. I'm not suggesting a constitutional amendment to change the First Amendment. But we have to be aware, as we're dealing in a world where increasingly racial hostilities, hostility against immigrants, against Muslims, it's fueled by the notion that somehow good speech is over, going to overcome bad speech. It's not happening. The bad speech is prevailing. And that takes me to my third and last point, which relates to the internet. Um, we live in a world where social media is pervasive. And this also goes to the notion of elites you know, having controlled the debate. The internet is, uh, is liberating to many people. They can go online and find things that make them happy, make them satisfied. They can find somebody who's saying what they feel in their heart. It may or may not be true, um, but they no longer have to rely on the New York Times or NBC. And so we live in a very fractious world, and the social media, the power of social media, the pace, the volume, the ubiquitousness is actually making us more divided, and it's enhancing, in my judgment, the populism that we're talking about. This is a scary moment for our democracies, where, in effect, we have yielded the notion of what's true and what's, what's propaganda. And we just did a report out of our center looking at two particular bad actors. One is ISIS. The other is the Russian government. According to our intelligence agencies, there were 1,000 Russian agents working in 2016 on the American election. This is an asymmetrical war being fought where political disinformation is being pushed into the system by a hostile state. If we ignore that, we do it at our own peril. And this is not just about elections. It's about daily interaction within our society. What the Russians are doing is amplifying our own differences. They, they don't need to define our differences. We do that quite well by ourselves. But they are very good at taking advantage of our, uh, uh, of our contentiousness and putting it on steroids. So I think there's a real, if we're talking about dealing with populism, if we don't pay more attention, we heard references today from the Philippines, from Myanmar, from Venezuela, of authoritarian governments misusing the internet. It's happening in our own society. And we're flat-footed. And again, we're living in the world where Brandeis says good speech overcomes bad speech. When the internet is involved, that's no longer operable. So let me stop with that. Uh, Jerry, as the, as the final speaker here before the open discussion, I think it's uh, to take a moment to pay tribute to you and the folks who put this uh, conference together. It's really been a terrific two days of, uh, of discussion, and thanks for bringing us all together. Um, and I, let, let me start with just a, a couple of comments based on what's been said here before I get into my remarks. The first, you know, I was really taken, Jeremy, by the quote from the Daily Mail about, um, uh, about how rapists are protected by uh, uh, by human rights, and um, this is also, you know, in the in the famous uh, I'll talk about this later. Trump's famous statement about um, Mexicans sending us rapists to our country. That there's a real gendered side of populism. I don't think we've talked enough about actually over the last couple of days. Um, that it's almost the protect, you know, the the the, the male protection of the the the, the woman uh, that need. I mean, it's, it seems to be a theme in populism, and I and I and I think we I think we need to analyze that more than we've done. It just keeps cropping up, and we haven't we haven't noticed it enough. And and Jerry, we'll forgive you for ending with a panel of all white men up here because you did have a panel of all women earlier. So, so uh, that's okay. Um, the second is um, the uh, the notion of foreign doctrines being imported 
uh, Jeremy, that you talked about, Jerry, you talked about in your, your st in the last panel. I'm going to talk about uh, also foreign imports, foreign people. And these foreign bodies, which are actually raced bodies, I think, as Michael was pointing out here, um, in a very concrete, material way, show the intrusion of the foreign. Um, and I think we need to think about both you know, how these go together, how, they, how, the, how the foreign can come in in many ways, as well as digitally, as, as Mike was pointing out here. Um, uh, so um, uh, concerns about uh, virulent opposition to immigration has really been at the center of a lot of the populist talk, the populist movements in a number of states. And here I'll focus mainly on the US and Europe. I know we had panels this morning on, on, on Asia and, and, and on Latin America, but most of my remarks will go to the populist movements in, in, in US and Europe. Um, uh, and I want to talk about the relationship of uh, populism and immigration uh, uh, to theories of constitutional democracy. And what I mean by that, when I, when I, my understanding of constitutional democracy uh, is um, a, a representative government elected by the people with an independent judiciary that protects fundamental rights and a fundamental equality among citizens in a uh, demarcated uh, territory, a, a somewhat a closed territory. My, my contention will be that immigration destabilizes theories of constitutional democracy. Um, that the arrival of a large number of non-citizens, first of all, it undercuts the idea of a bounded polity. Um, the residents of non-citizens inside the country then open up questions of equality. Do we mean all people in the society or just equality for citizens? Um, and then enforcement measures that are adopted to deal with foreigners who shouldn't be here, we don't want here uh, anymore, um, often run up against fundamental values of due process, fairness, uh, uh, and the like. So, so, so our, our neat picture of state, citizen, territory is problematized by um, the fact of immigration. And these puzzles, can, I mean, this conceptual puzzle can go in, in two ways, and I want to trace these out. Um, in, in my, my, my few minutes here, uh, for, for human rights advocates and, and constitutional rights advocates, the fundamental rights are not limited to citizens. They pertain to people, uh, to all uh, human beings. And they apply within territory, anyone within a territory of a state, that state should be respecting um, people's uh, human rights. Um, there's perhaps a recognized political role for citizens, perhaps, in terms of elections, uh, and the like, but that's not consistent with the general protections for people qua people. For the populace, however, the, the notion of a constitutional democracy runs, runs the other way. And, and I think the power, I'll say this a bit more, the power of the populist critique of, uh, on immigration is not that they're purporting to establish new norms. Uh, they're purporting to return to fundamental norms at the base of a constitutional uh, democracy, to the state, territory, citizen, uh, construct. So the idea is that constitutional democracies are created for a demos, a citizenry. Uh, and there's generally assumed to be a congruence between the two, the people and the country. So the United States Supreme Court, in an opinion by Justice Black in the middle of the 20th century, said a, a remarkable sentence, citizenship in this nation is part of a cooperative affair. Its citizenry is the country, and the country is the citizenry. So it's very tight, tight congruence here. Um, and then we defend this order in, in constitutionally in very appealing ways. Popular sovereignty, equality of citizens, fundamental rights, none of which need include um, uh, non-members and for the first two doesn't include uh, non-members. Um, so let me, let me expand on these ideas and see, see, where they, see where they lead. Now, to say that the the foundations of constitutional democracy support um, this tight construct, this congruence of citizen and, and, um, and country, um, is not to say there aren't plausible arguments for inclusion of non-citizens. And let me, let me make a few of those arguments. So first, uh, to think about the founding of the, uh, uh, of, of the country. You know, in, in most constitutional theory, the constitutional law classes, uh, start with an existing constitution, as if it kind of appeared out of nowhere. You maybe read about the Constitutional Convention. But there's no norm that legitimizes the adoption of that 
Constitution. There's not, there's, there's not an attempt to legitimize the adoption of the Constitution. Um, the state exists and exercises sovereignty um, over territory because people have called it into being in some sometimes somewhat mysterious, uh, mysterious way. Um, Non-citizens challenge that constitutional bootstrap because they say, what about us? What, what gave you guys the rights to form a country, claim uh, sovereignty over a territory of the earth that belongs to all of us, and to keep us out? Uh, and you know, when often states write back and uh, call back and say, well, you know, it's our state. We did it. It's, it's, it's tough luck. You know? And, and uh, that's what popular sovereignty is about. And you weren't here, and you can't make a claim about it. It's harder for constitutional democracies to say that. It's one thing for a king to say, you're not one of my subjects. It's another thing for a group of free and equal people to tell other human beings that they are something less than that. And so one argument against uh, for inclusion here is that the, the construction of a demos is really a nasty piece of work in, in some ways. Secondly, who can participate? So normally we think in democracy, in, uh, in constitutional democracies, that people to whom the law applies have a right to participate in the laws that bind them and control them. Uh, and now it's, it's plain that uh, uh, resident uh, foreigners inside, inside any of these uh, countries are taxed, they're regulated, the criminal laws apply, uh, and the like. So the claim would be, well, be, by being regulated, we ought to have a chance to participate um, we have uh, in these rules. In fact, political theory goes further. There are now claims that people outside the country should be able to participate to the extent that their their lives are affected by by what the state is doing. This kind of all affected uh, thought about about uh, really that people anywhere in any any state should be able to participate in all elections, given a globalized world where uh, the the conduct of all states affects the others. Now, I'm not going to go that far. I'm saying certainly for people inside the country, there's a claim to inclusion in the democratic process, which then undermines this state citizen um, uh, territory construct. Um, thirdly, um, we think about uh, workers uh, in the following way. So, so most constitutional doctrines, not all, but most um, have large numbers of immigrants and uh, allow immigrants to come in to work. Uh, and uh, there was a, a, a famous uh, a quote from Max Frisch, we asked for workers and human beings came. Uh, and the idea is you can't just bring people in to work in constitutional democracies. We have a notion of, uh, of rights and, and fair treatment of people um, that they will then stake claims to, to treatment as, uh, as human beings. I, I was going to say something about refugees, but I'll, but I'll leave that out. But, but at least in these ways, we, we can see that there are claims for inclusion following norms or understandings of constitutional democracy that ought to open up constitutional democracies to these kinds of claims. Now, uh, um, and, and even perhaps go so far as to undermine really the, the fundamental uh, position in international law and American constitutional law and constitutional laws of many states of the plenary power of states to determine their immigration uh, policies. Um, and I think a lot of us thought we were moving this way uh, over the last 10, 20, uh, 30 years, that there would be increasing recognition of fundamental rights for citizens, uh, there'd be human rights in European democracies, mainly constitutionally based rights in the United States and Canada from charters and constitutions, but nonetheless that there was an, an inclusion process going on and perhaps even an end to the plenary power doctrine. And there was a kind of a constitutional settlement reached. I'm relying here on a phrase from Linda Bosniak who talked about uh, 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 principles that were, they were hard on the outside but soft on the inside, meaning that, that states maintained an ability to have membership policies about who could come in. But once they let people in, then they had these people had to be treated almost equally, except maybe for political rights to citizens in terms of um, fundamental rights. And I think that's, you know, that was a nice, it's a nice accommodation because it still gives the demos the people constructing the immigration rules to decide who comes in and enjoys the demos, but it says once you've invited them in, then they need to be uh, treated fairly under the Constitution. Um, okay, and in fact, I think this the settlement is represented in um, various constitutional decisions and constitutional democracies to the extent that phrases in Constitution that mention persons are interpreted to mean not just not citizens, but all persons who were there in typical human rights language isn't used, but it's similar to human rights thinking. And I, 
um, there's even a South, there's a South African Supreme Court uh, decision that was uh, faced with a constitutional provision that's saying everyone had a right to social assistance and the court ruled uh, that meant uh, foreigners as well as, uh, as well as citizens and there are other decisions uh, in other courts um, as well. Um, and this also fit, I mean, another way the courts got at this was that um, in, in a liberal democracy, um, lines are allowed to be drawn between groups and among groups so long as there is a, uh, uh, so, so long as the line is not arbitrary. And increasingly lines drawn between citizens and non-citizens appeared to be, uh, to be arbitrary. Okay, so if that's the constitutional settlement and the slight intrusion into the state territory citizen construct, and maybe we are moving further towards deeper notions of human rights for, uh, for non-citizens, then comes the, uh, uh, the, populist, uh, the populist challenge. Uh, and I mean, I think the constitutional settlement holds when the numbers are low and when people aren't worried. Now, I've always, um, it always interests me that the moment at which the Supreme Court announced in the United States that alien, alienage was a discrete and insular minority under footnote four reasoning that then uh, required strict scrutiny for state, not federal, but state regulations that harmed immigrants. It was actually the year that the US farm born population was at its lowest for the entire century, down to below 4%. So it was a time when immigration slowed down, we were accepting immigrants, we could be nice to immigrants, but now we're in, uh, in another historical moment where we have a so-called a crisis of immigration. And here, the populist arguments flip the arguments I've just made or have a new set of arguments that, again, as I keep saying, are fully compatible with this underlying construct of a constitutional democracy. So first, flipping the normative claim for inclusion. I gave you a couple of claims for why we may think it's reasonable under principles we all accept to include immigrants. Uh, uh, and now uh, the claim is, no, they are out. And of course, Trump's America First slogan is the, the clearest to that. But Geert Wilders' a Party of uh, Freedom uh, in the Netherlands uh, stated in its uh, election literature in 2016, it said, instead of financing the entire world and people do, we don't want here, we'll spend money on ordinary Dutch citizens. They didn't say indigenous, but they came close there. OK. <laughs> you know, so on this line of reasoning, um, the, it, in democracies, the demos means something. It's a special, uh, you know, membership has its privileges, as the old line went. That's what, that's preferring citizens to what states uh, should be about. And from this perspective, any kind of claim of, uh, utopian claim of common ownership of the earth uh, or other sorts of uh, hazy claims for, for human rights for all, just, they, they just don't, <laughs> it's just a stiff arm to those kinds of arguments once you take a very strong sense of what the demos is all about. Um, secondly, um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of any state, particularly constitu uh, constitutional democracies included, there will always be a claim that states have a right to preserve themselves, uh, and immigration is portrayed in always uh, typically cataclysmic terms, right? Floods of immigrants, invasions of immigrants, um, and uh, so Donald Trump again said when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best, they're sending people with a lot of problems, they're bringing those problems in, they're bringing drugs, they're bringing crime, they're, they're rapists, right, yeah. Um, and also when he talked about the diversity, diversity, diversity visa program, he said, you know, foreign states, it allows them to, quote, give us their worst people, which is an entire misunderstanding of how the lottery works, but nonetheless, it was a sense of people sending us their worst people, and the idea was a state is not a state if it can't con control its borders. And it's not only when states send bad people, but other, other people coming in on their own. And uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, the National Front, uh, leader of the National Front in France, said it this way, at some point in the 2000s, migrants and their children, not all but a large majority, declared war on France. They've intimidated and threatened France via a series of anti-French and terrorist attacks. Civil war is no longer a dream, but a real possibility. So the populist answer here is that we, for self-defense, uh, for, for national preservation, and it applies to democracies as well, we need to be concerned about, them, uh, about um, immigration. And the third point here is, uh, you old know, saying demography is destiny. Um, there's been a substantial increase in foreign-born populations. As I mentioned, the US was at a low in 71. Now the US foreign-born population is up to 14%, nearly 14%, which a number that hadn't been 
oh boy, achieved um, for many, uh, since the early part of the century. Uh, in, in Sweden and Austria, it's 18%, Germany 15%, um, and other European countries over, uh, over 10%. So immigration is seen as a real threat to the demos, to the, to the conception of the demos, to the way the demos conceptualizes itself. Right? There's a sense that we are losing our country uh, in, the populist, uh, in the populist language. Um, okay, I'll skip over some um, economic arguments here. Now, these could be met, these claims could be met uh, by counterclaims like facts, like in fact migration is pretty much under control in most of these states. When, in an earlier paper, version of this paper, Jerry commented, yeah, by violating people's human rights is so essentially what you said. He didn't quite say it in those terms, <laughs> and so I have to uh, take that into account. But, but nonetheless, um, migration is not a threat in any serious way to the... Um, to, the, to, to the life of these uh, countries. And moreover, there's a recognition of a need for migration as populations, uh, without, without migration. Um, <laughs> migration is responsible for 100% of population growth in Germany, Spain, Italy, Poland, Hungary, Finland, and Japan. W without <laughs> migration, you'd have falling populations in those countries. Deaths are, are um, exceeding births. Okay. Um, but these arguments, as was mentioned, uh, facts don't always rule the day, uh, and um, uh, we are likely to see strong uh, the populist until control is really attained. Control appears to be attained in the minds of people. We will continue to see the power um, of the populist uh, argument. Okay, so I've got to skip. I'm sorry. Let me. Um, huh. um, Let me get to the, I guess I'll get to the end here then. Um, okay, so here's what I've, here's what I've been claiming. That the human rights thinking has been important to the protection uh, of migrants uh, as persons through the anti-discrimination principle, but the reassertion of the citizenship, uh, citizen state territory linkage dramatically under, can undercut that uh, progress. And these are the appeals that, uh, the way populist appeals are being made. And that's what gives, my claim is that's what gives them their force, is that they are so consistent, compatible with fundamental ideas of constitutional uh, democracies. Um, any reason for optimism? Perhaps. Um, uh, uh, to take uh, Mike's point about change from within, that human rights has to come from within, one might say that in fact the large number of immigrants that have actually come into these states uh, may well, in the end, turn them. So California became a blue state after, prop, uh, after the, the anti-immigrant proposition was adopted when Governor Wilson was, uh, when Pete Wilson was, uh, was the governor. So that perhaps the fact of immigration itself will ultimately uh, bring about um, a change uh, in these states. It's remarkable, if you think about it, the salience of the dreamers issue. These are undocumented kids in the United States, and yet that has gripped uh, the Democratic Party, not to full success yet, but through the courts. Uh, but, but the fact that that can be a salient political issue says something about the power of pro-immigrant uh, positions. In the long run, and here I'll, I'll stop, um, once we get past this historical hump, if we do, um, I think there's a, I mean, the, 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 we have to seriously think about whether or not migration patterns will ultimately transform our thinking about democracy and our thinking about the meaning of sovereignty. Um, that maybe residence, not citizenship, will be the basis for constitutional rights. A recognition of transnational com uh, communities, greater free movement, if, uh, perhaps regionally if not uh, globally, might all be in the long run a function of the immigra uh, immigration and the need for immigration that will begin to replace, to transform the state territory uh, citizenship uh, construct. I, I don't have any predictions here. Regression at the, repression at the moment seems more likely than transformation. Perhaps the center will hold, but uh, the political instability of the moment, I think, just simply magnifies this conceptual instability of an immigrant's place and human rights uh, in constitutional democracy. Other's presentations more than they already have. Let me go sort of do it. Again. I, mean, I just wanted to say one thing to Alex, um, which is, I think in a way the distinction between citizen and non-citizen 
is more layered and more nuanced than you suggest. I speak as a, somebody who's lived here for 30 odd years as a non-citizen. I have the status of a US person. Uh, I can participate by contributing to campaign contributions and publish and write letters. There's a natural path to citizenship if I want to take it. All I have to do is, is, is uh, fill out a form. There's no your sanguineous notion of citizenship that would oppose me. I mean, we have a cosmopolitan conception of citizenship. And um, so there are just a number of layers that mitigate, I think, maybe the stark contrast that you, you put forward. The danger is, of course, that, that that's not set in stone. That could be changed. Well, then that, that's my point, right? I mean, I think you're right. I think that's part of the constitutional settlement is that resident aliens or, oh, sorry, resident non-citizens are... Uh, legal you know, permanent residents. Legal permanent green card holders um, are virtually treated like citizens in, yeah. in most, in most uh, certainly as to state functions, federal functions, uh, a little bit differently. I think the settlement is not written in stone. I mean, the, you know, these court decisions can go the other way. I mean, courts could decide that person just means citizen. Um, uh, in in some of these constitutions, and and where courts don't do it, courts can be reformed. I just mentioned in an earlier panel. I mean, what's happened in Poland, and is, and in Venezuela, uh, is that the courts have been quote unquote reformed by changing the number of judges, by taking issues away from judges, by shortening the length of terms and the like. So, so that is more. I mean, if the populist moment really comes, it's not, it, this. You know, I, I I'd urge you to naturalize. <laughs> Jamie, is that your hand? Jimmy O'Connell. Call. Um, so, um, so Jeremy, thank you for your uh, somewhat impassioned plea that we actually, as uh, academics uh, sitting in elite institutions, listen to people. I think that's absolutely well taken, um, both as citizens and as uh, in our capacity as human rights uh, people, um, some experts certainly among our group. I, I think there are a couple of obvious uh, answers about what we could learn. Um, and then there's an interesting wrinkle I think that our discussions sort of bring for one of them. So the two obvious ones are for greater democratic inclusion in the political system and for greater attention to economic issues, at least in the US and Europe. Um, it, on the, the latter, Ruth, of course, mentioned this yesterday and Phil, echoing Philip Alston's uh, call in his, his very interesting article, which you cite in your paper. Um, it seems to me that the second one, uh, so then the question is whether we need to attend to these as human rights people or through human rights work. Um, it seems to me that if we think about the second one, the attention to economic and social inclusion as a matter of economic and social rights, then this is perhaps a sort of interesting tension uh, with Larry's urging that we not expand notions of rights. Um, and that's, uh, I, I'm quite sympathetic to that. I think his critique of the Inter-American Court and Commission focuses more on, uh, on, on more controversial, newer rights than classic economic and social. But on the other hand, what we take economic and social rights to mean in practice is something that notwithstanding the the indivisibility rhetoric is sort of still in play. Um, that, I think, though, can be solved some by, by adopting something of Mike's lowercase c Catholicism, um, both historically in your career as a rights activist and as you just expressed on the panel. And that is, is opening up our notions of tactics uh, in, in operating as activists, not, uh, not just judges or commissioners. Um, people can use tactics like organizing, education, um, empowerment techniques, uh, reporting and in innovative ways for businesses to, to act in this field. And that may be less problematic than expanding technical legal rights um, through international bodies. Um, so I just wanted to toss those out there as attempts to contribute to the conclusions. I mean, I was going to immediately refer to what Mike had said about you know, social security rights and, and, and various rights under, under the welfare state, such as it is, are important. We have to be very careful that we don't use the word rights, so it's simply identified with human rights. But we also have to make sure that if we do regard something as a human right, it can perfectly well be realized at the statutory level, at the common law level, at the level of um, uh, ordinary legal provision. I think the other, the other point, just very briefly, is um, 
I mean, I made the, the argument about attending to minima. I don't think we should necessarily buy into the proposition that the civil and political rights are the minima and the economic and social rights are the luxuries. There may be minima on both sides of that demand. I'm enough of a fan of Henry Shu to accept that position. Or, or Maslow, yes, right. Commissioner Reyes? Thank you, um, Jimena Reyes. Uh, listening to populist, uh, no, not so much leaders who very often instrumentalize ideas, but, uh, but to populist voters, as you were advising us to, to do, that genuinely uh, believe what populists are, are saying, I wonder if um, the human rights movement um, has uh, work less on issues of economic and social right, and in particular on linking them with the issue of inequality and redistribution. Because um, on the one hand, um, as opposed to, for example, the issue of discrimination that's been very high on the priority of human rights movement, because on the one hand, it's easier, uh, it has been easier to obtain impacts uh, even if it doesn't, not solving the, the, this, this, the discrimination problems, but at least to obtain uh, impacts like, for example, uh, gay marriage or uh, having government, having minorities in, uh, in, their, in, their, in, their, in their government. And on the other hand, also, because when you speak about um, a redistribution and inequality as a, a human rights defender, you are really at the border of speaking about politics, and so getting into not being anymore. So it, it's it's a, it's a it's a, um, a, a tricky issue, and I wonder what the, what you you think about uh, about that. So I have a couple of uh, reactions to that. One is, um, I I think we first of all there's a disconnect between what people prioritize in less developed countries and what people prioritize in the rights discussion, particularly here. Um, it's probably the case that if you're doing human rights work in the United States, you're, um, you come out of a legal tradition, you're focused on legal constitutional norms and the kinds of issues you're talking about, discrimination, fair trial, free speech, are prominent in what you're doing and the economic sphere feels like entitlements, it's political, it's something else. I don't think that's the way the international system is set up. It really does regard these as, in, as integrated and, and in, inseparable. Now having said that, it doesn't mean, I'm not making the case that somehow we ought to try to persuade the US Supreme Court that housing is a human right. We've already, that was tried seven, 60 years ago, 50 years ago. You know, there's a slew of cases, the National Welfare Rights Organization kept bringing the ca these cases and the court said, these are not constitutional rights. That doesn't mean they're not rights. And it certainly doesn't mean that people who are part of a populist movement aren't paying attention. They're actually paying more attention to those things than most of what we're talking about today. And so I think both from a theological perspective, we don't have to go at it and say, these are human rights, you have to treat them as human rights. We have to say these are things that matter and we ought to be trying to figure out what does it mean when somebody loses their job in you know, Steubenville, Ohio, and what are we doing about that? That has rights consequences. It, is, it does get you into a political, social discussion, but I think if we're serious about trying to react to what's going on, if we ignore that range of things, we do it at our own peril. Mike, can I just, uh, uh, I, um, I think you're missing a lot of the action that's happening at the grassroots level. So there's a huge amount of work on environmental justice in this country. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work on homelessness, actually, as it stated as a right for people to have a home. There's uh, a lot of work on domestic violence. The, I mean, you have hundreds of thousands of people marching today mm -hmm. for physical security. So maybe you're overly focused on the lawyers and not focused en en enough on really, there, there may be more of a, a overlap than, than you think here. I, I, I accept all of that. I guess what I would say is that uh, often the movements you're talking about are um, 
focused on and populated by people that are at the lowest end of our spectrum. And what we're not doing enough is focusing on people who have had traditional jobs in manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera, and are now out of a job and now blaming the system for their economic disempowerment. We need both in terms of what we focus on and how we speak to people to be inclusive and in trying to listen, again, listen to what they're saying and trying to bring them in rather than sort of demonizing their existence and what they represent. People are hurting and we ought to be mindful of the fact that there's things that need to be done in the name of government, in the name of human rights, to address the things that uh, are causing them pain. If I could just uh, insert myself into this part of the conversation, mm. I want to make a technical point. Uh, I said earlier something about human rights being morality, law, and politics. When we're talking about economic and social rights, to a very significant degree, we're talking about something which is morality and politics, yep. but not law in the United States, because yeah. the United States has distanced itself from the international law instruments on economic uh, and social rights. And so it's hard enough to make an argument about civil and political rights right. uh, in the United States in an international human rights framing. It's actually not available in the same way for the most part uh, with regard to economic and social rights. That doesn't mean that it's not morality and politics, and it doesn't mean that you can't say this should be a legal right, and this is a legal right in all the other countries of the world. Why isn't it a legal right here? Yeah. Uh, but there, there is a, yeah. a missing piece uh, of the mobilization because of US treaty practice. So let's separate two different things here. Um, what you're saying is that as a matter of international human rights doctrine, the United States, States doesn't play ball. That's absolutely right. That doesn't mean there's not law. I mean, we have a law called Medicare. Uh, we have a law called Social Security. We have an agency called uh, HUD, which focuses HUD, which focuses on how housing and urban development. It certainly since the 1930s, there have been a range of laws and regulations that relate to a whole uh, set of economic and social issues. Right. And and the goal is to you know again we don't have to necessarily lead by saying this is an international human rights issue, but we ought not to be shy about saying. This is part of a human rights agenda that has an element that's law and an element that's policy, an element that's you know social change. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been very patient at the back. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you all for the really interesting discussion. Um, I just have a question following on from Professor Aldrin's comments. Um, I was wondering if you think there are any particular aspects of the mentality or approach of the human rights community that you think need to shift in order for us to be more open to listening and earnestly examining popular sentiments. Um, because it seems like sometimes the, perhaps the slightly black and white moral authority claimed by the human rights movement um, and in the international human rights sphere, the kind of naming and shaming methodology might sometimes make that sort of dialogue difficult. Yeah. Um, I think you're right. Um, let me preface this by saying that I am in awe of the work done by the human rights community uh, in dealing with some of the most unpleasant uh, issues on the planet. But the shift in mentality that I think is necessary is the recognition that human rights enterprise won't work unless human rights have a foothold and a secure foothold in the imagination and thinking of ordinary people. And we are not redeemed or excused from that by thinking of these as rights of minorities so we don't have to worry about the majority opinion. Human rights will not work unless it has a secure foothold in the, in the majority, in the mentality of majority of ordinary people, in which case, as you said, we have to avoid talking down from a position of self-righteousness. We need to acknowledge our own doubts about some of this, um, some of these issues, and we need, above all, as I've said a million times, to listen. Um, this is, uh, I just want to add one word to that, <clears throat> and I say this as part of the a group of people who's been involved in the human rights movement for a long time. Human rights groups tend to be much better diagnosticians than, and, than prescription and solution people. We're very good at identifying the problem. The idea that we're naming and shaming has a certain value. It identifies the problem, 
but we're much less adept at listening, figuring out what's actually going on and how do you get at solving it. And I think that covers a whole range of things, not just this discussion, but it's particularly true here. We have to listen. This is sort of goes back to what Jeremy said. We've got to listen to what's on people's mind and try to figure out what exactly would make those people um, less hostile to the kinds of things we're trying to talk about. Matthew Stevenson. Hi. So thanks for a terrific panel um, and, and conference overall. Uh, my, my question, I think, follows very directly from the last several in that it has to do with the strategies and rhetoric of human rights activists and organizations when they are dealing with populist governments. And the way I want to frame the, the question I want to ask is by using a parallel with a community I know much better, which is the anti-corruption community. Um, that community, when confronted with successful populist movements, particularly I'm thinking about Trump in the United States, but this would pl apply elsewhere as well, often confront this dilemma of whether to engage or confront, mm -hmm. by which I mean there is a choice that different organizations or, or in some cases individual activists need to make between emphasizing all of the failings of the populace, all of the dangers that have been discussed here, the, the contempt for checks and balances, the overt corruption, conflict of interest, et cetera, and taking a much more confrontational posture, or trying to find points of common ground or to frame the agenda in language that might be appealing to the current administration. So again, in the context that I know best, the anti-corruption context, the, the po folks are pushing for things like more company ownership transparency, mm -hmm. have put a lot of emphasis on drugs and terrorism. Uh, others focus on more conventional forms of corruption has, have emphasized corruption in the immigration context. Uh, or have emphasized the way in which foreigners are unfairly taking advantage of the benefits of our financial system in ways that would appeal. And the basic trade-off, again, this is probably familiar, and I think it's true in a lot of other areas as well, if you jump up and down and scream that they're all a bunch of crooks and liars, you're not going to get a seat at the table, which means you're not going to be able to find ways to practically advance your agenda. But if you do seek the seat at the table by tamping down your rhetoric and trying to collaborate, there's a worry about losing your own legitimacy as an organization and maybe giving some legitimacy to right. So that's, sorry for the long preface, but I want to try to set it up. And the question I have is, does that dilemma port over into the human rights context with respect to how human rights activists may want to engage with populist governments? And if so, on the engagement side, what would that look like? And this picks up on themes that all of you have touched on, but what would it look like for a committed human rights organization to go to an Erdogan or a Trump or a Duterte or whatever and find a way to frame at least part of the human rights agenda that those leaders or, or their administrations would find congenial? And on the confrontation side, to pick up on a theme that's been discussed earlier, I, I feel like there's this concern that traditional naming and shaming with respect to these regimes is not only not effective, but actually counterproductive in that part of their appeal is precisely that they're being denounced by all of these representatives of you know, the global elite. So for those organizations that say we want to maintain a confrontational critical posture, is there a way they can do that without playing into the populist hands and allowing them to say in a kind of weird perversion of FDR, judge me by the enemies that I have made? It seems to me that, that I mean, I can't give a full answer. I don't think anybody can. But one beginning is to realize that the human rights community is not just one thing. It's a variety of organizations, a variety of scholars, and a variety of people. And half of them can be screaming confrontationally at, at Mr. Trump, while the other half are going in the back door of the White House and seeing... Uh, yeah, that's right. So there's good cop, bad cop. And the other thing is that I, as I listen to what's been said on the panel here today, the concern is not just to find common ground. The, the concern is to find ground from the other side that makes us feel the ground slip away from our feet. Yeah, it's, the, it's the, to listen to some stuff that may change us, not just a log roll with Orban or log roll with, with Trump to find... Um, Common mission. Not that I'm denigrating that, but that, but 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 the concern is is for there to be learning on both sides, and not just sort of fake demonstrated learning, so that we can uh, carry favour with the populists. 
And the final point is just as the human rights organization is not just one thing, but uh, thousands of organizations and, and hundreds of thousands of scholars and advocates and activists, so also the populists are not just one thing. I don't know that you can have a lot to learn from what President Trump says about human rights. I'm sure as hell you have a lot to learn from what some of Trump voters uh, think about human rights. Yeah, just on that point, I would say there's multiple audiences here. Um, the Dutartes or the Trumps probably are not people you engage with easily, um, but they're people in their governments that may not agree with them. There's certainly plenty of people in the U.S. government or that are going crazy now. There's plenty of room to engage with them. We also have a Congress that has a whole range of different perspectives. And then most importantly, they're the people who voted for a Trump or whoever who are in various stages of either full support, you know, doubting, beginning to wonder. Part of this is engaging with the people that are going to make the decision the next time. Very quick, and um, just to follow Jeremy's point, just uh, thinking back on my experience at UNHCR, um, there were often very strong NGO advocates who would yell at us and yell at the state, and then we could go in and make the make the pitch that would get some change. Now, did that corrupt UNHCR in some way? We were accused of being too close to the government. On the other hand, it achieved results, but part of our success was because the guys outside were screaming, so we were the, the reasonable ones that that they could deal with. Jake Sudersky. Thank you. So I would like to, just to follow up on the last three or four uh, points made, I would like uh, maybe to play a role of devil's advocate. And the, and the devil in this case is a liberal who refuses to participate in this game of self-flagellation and saying, yeah, we must have been wrong because, look, uh, populist uh, successes are a symptom of our own sins. And I make this point not as a, uh, as a tactical point mm, regarding human rights organizations. This is the point which I sort of, uh, mm, which I'm not too competent to make, but rather as a point about certain integrity of, of argument. Because I see it, and I, I'm talking about it from my own experience of participating in public debates in Poland, and I can see that on the side of my sort of quote, unquote, friends, my allies, people who, who are liberal Democrats, who were both intellectually and politically uh, implicated or, or, or active in the ancien regime, ancien, ancien now, that is until 2015, that there is this tendency of self-blaming and saying, well, you know, after all, you know, there are all these things which we can learn from them. And I think that Perhaps that is true, but we also have to remember about the, uh, about the costs of that and that we shouldn't cross certain lines. We shouldn't say, yes, probably they are right. And that is, you know, there is a tendency, for example, Kasmade says, well, I consider populism as a democratic, liber democratic illiberal uh, response to years of uh, liberal non-democracy. I think it's a nonsense. You know, there's nothing democratic about, about populists. So, there, perhaps we have to find some balance between your Jeremy's approach, that is, let's listen to them carefully and let's see, perhaps there are some you know, elements of rational core, and on the other hand saying, but on many issues they are damn wrong, and we, we have to say it openly. And some of the ideas about human rights, which you have, with which you, Almost all I agree, perhaps except for the last balancing thing. Uh, they may come from perfectly, you know, integral liberal position without necessarily, you know, without any help from our populist friends. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so I'm thinking that there must be a few inches of in between between self righteousness on the one hand, which is what I'm combating, and self flagellation. On the other hand, maybe there's a little bit of territory in between. At any rate, that's where I want to occupy it. And of course, it doesn't follow that I must abandon uh, cherished positions. Um, I must always hold my mind uh, ready to listen to what can be said. Um, and I don't think it does any great credit to us to listen for something from the populist movement and then try and give credit for it to some other elite source, as though we, it's too, too smelly to, to, to attribute it to the, uh, 
our populist interlocutors. And finally, just very, very quickly, I mean, many of you are activists, some of us are academics, and there's one thing that academics are very bad at, and that's getting out into society and talking to people who are not academics. Um, and the more we can do that in this context, I think, the better. Find settings like churches and companies and, and but sports where you talk to people uh, who aren't cocooned in the same bubble as we are. I would just add to that, that <clears throat> agreeing entirely with uh, Jeremy, but the thing that's most troubling to me, anxiety producing in this society, is the, the racism and the xenophobia and the religious intolerance that is imbued in a lot of what is said. I think on that we have to be absolutely crystal clear and solid that those are things that are objectionable and outrageous. But those things stem from other things. They're sort of text and context. It doesn't mean that it's excusable, but you sort of have to go below that and say, how did it get to this point? And you have to try to figure out what are the things that could be done other than accepting those things that would in some ways mitigate or make those things less pernicious. That's where I think we are right now. There's a lot of blaming and demonizing of the other because my life is miserable. And so we don't, we don't accept the demonizing, but we have to figure out what are the things that would make those people uh, uh, less intolerant. So uh, I'm missing from, from Jeremy and Mike here are whether these are tactical considerations or principled considerations. Mike, you start off by saying your opening statement was we've got to condemn uh, left-wing populism and right-wing populism right. as Latin, but we've got to be principled here. But um, this last response was much more tactical. If we're going to win, we've got to listen to these people so we can put our arguments in a way that will then appeal to them. And I, I'm not against tactical arguments, but I'm, I'm wondering <clears throat> what, what we're saying there. Which, which is it? Oh, I think it's a principled <laughs> position that's tactically smart. <laughs> right. Too cute, too cute. No, no but, but some principled positions have a means end structure to them. Yeah. So when I said beforehand that the human rights enterprise ultimately won't work and won't last unless it develops a secure foothold in the, in the minds of many of the people who we say are participants in populist movements, that's a, that's a, a tactic with regard to the end of securing the human rights movement. Well, but I'm wondering about the civil rights movement in this country um, that succeeded by not saying no. You know, could you, <coughs> racial equality, just as Mike said. So for race is non-negotiable for him. Sure. But other things apparently are negotiable. And it's not obvious to me how we choose which and which it tactically even is the better way to go. If you relentlessly say race discrimination is not permissible, sure. you changed a society by doing that. So even tactically, I'm not sure. I think we are now in the closing portion of the program. <laughs> Uh, Does that mean we have to adopt a different tone? I, <laughs> well, I, there, there is a difference of tone that I want to adopt, which is that uh, please do keep your interventions relatively short, but they don't have to be phrased as questions that the panelists have to answer. Please. Thank you. So my question is, um, like, uh, for human rights groups, uh, like basic rights are different level in international in different countries because I'm from other countries, so I know, and I, I lived here 16, 17 years. So how that, uh, that human rights group, how that, how prioritizing uh, to advocate that in different level? We, uh, I mean, different here and different other countries, and how that. Um, how that happens or how human groups prioritize that. Can I ask, you're asking this question as a general matter? Or you're asking this question in the context of? No, generally, internationally, government. like in different countries are yeah. different. And in some countries are still tortures. A lot of mm -hmm. basic things are not even uh, considered uh, human rights. And here is different and in different places. So how the human rights group approaches that to address uh, issues uh, in different uh, places. Well, well, I think I would say in part to that's an issue. That's an issue as to which there is an, there's the question of role differentiation. Uh, there are human rights NGOs, 
that have particular missions uh, that will deal with those missions uh, in, in a variety of different countries. There are human rights bodies <coughs> internationally that have particular segments of the human rights uh, system uh, that they deal with. Um, and then there are others that have very broad mandates uh, and that then have to choose. They do have a variety of choices to make uh, in prioritizing. There are general human rights uh, NGOs, international NGOs, uh, that also have to uh, choose to make prioritization. And those priority decisions may in part be questions of what are the most severe problems that have to be dealt with, but also may be questions about what are the most tractable problems for which something could be accomplished in the near future, uh, or in part are questions of where do they have uh, the best comparative expertise in order to be making uh, appropriate contributions uh, to the solving of those problems. So those are, those are some of the things that have to enter into a complex uh, configuration. But I would just add one thing, agreeing with Jerry, but going back to Alex's point about principle, one of the advantages of the human rights movement is that we have a set of principles. They've been codified in both the Declaration of Human Rights and treaties, and they're quite clear about what is across the board required. There are minimum for every state, and so organizations that work on this have a Bible. They have a place to start. Those principles are not all created equal. There's some rights, rights that are called non-derogable. You can't do it no matter what, torture, slavery, et cetera. There's other things that are situational dependent. If you're in a state of emergency, you don't have to necessarily have all of the due process rights. But that's, that's the framework. It gives everybody working in this field something really to, to work on that is based on principle and law. Donna Schultz. So far, <clears throat> all, <clears throat> all the discussion has spoken of governments and populism. My question is, is it that limited? Could you have a populist labor union or a populist uh, religious movement or anything else in the non-state category, a populist uh, corporation? I think, I think the answer to that is a very, very clearly and importantly, yes. So you could have a populist, uh, a civil society whose flavor of institutions and interactions was more populist than it might be in another country. Um, there was, might be an atmosphere of um, uh, deference to uh, popular attitudes and there might be an atmosphere uh, conveyed in the resentments and angers of populist movements that affect the way that uh, unions work, as you said, affect the way certain churches work, and affect the way that the economy is structured. Um, as a matter of fact, I think in any society where populism is triumphing, it's never as, quite as simple as that. But you're absolutely right, it would be a mistake to focus only on um, governments and law, if only because most human rights and most of the respect that, we, that people demand of each other has to be elicited and has to be secured uh, informally and without the intervention of law. Sam um, Thanks very much. It, it struck me earlier that um, a lot of the panelists were acknowledging a degree of reasonable disagreement and pluralism in, in the interpretation and application of rights, whether that be prisoner voting rights or US immigration policy. Um, Jan Werner Muller observes that one of the key tenets of populism is that it is inherently anti-pluralist. Um, and I know that obviously that definition is open to disagreement, but to what extent do you think it's possible uh, um, in practice to, to listen and sit across the table from um, an anti-pluralist coming from a position of pluralism? And to what extent is it, it just going to be more likely from a negotiating position that the anti-pluralist is going to win out? Um, I'm sorry. No, go for it. Yeah. So, so first of all, there might be two different senses of pluralism here. The sense in which the populist is anti-pluralist has to do with the composition of the society and the normative um, makeup of the demos uh, that Alex referred to. And on that, the, the, 
the human rights advocate may find herself very strongly opposed to that pluralism. On the other hand, I'm thinking that the, excuse me, to that anti-pluralism. On the other hand, I'm thinking that when I talk, as I have here today, about issues in human rights theory, issues in human rights conceptions, on which reasonable disagreement is possible, and I think of the pluralism of different answers uh, to this, that might be a different matter. I'm not sure what populists would think would, would think about that. I think it's difficult even, even on our side because we think human rights is really, really important to get at and implement the right answer. And we can't say, ah, oh, you know, some people think this, some people think that, you guys go away and prioritize this, and, and we'll prioritize that in a, in a way that's going to happen just in the nature of things. But this isn't supposed to be stuff that we, that we can agree on to differ. Um, this is supposed to be uh, because it deals with moral minima, the basic fundamentals of respect. Uh, they're supposed to be right answers and we're supposed to be implementing them. That doesn't stop reasonable disagreement from arising and it doesn't stop us from trying to listen to possible sources of answers. I'm just wondering, I'm sitting here thinking about the relationship of nativism to populism um, and maybe we've been talking, or maybe I've been talking more about nativism than populism in the sense of it's the intrusion of the outsider, either idea or person, that's really what's objected to if that, I mean, if, if if that's a version of populism, then I don't I don't see populism as necessarily anti-pluralist. You could imagine a populism that is nativist, but open to different ideas within the society, however defined, different ideas of the good or the like, but may reject the outside. Now, some may say, well, that's really nativism, not populism, and we don't have that kind of fight. But I, yeah. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I want to ask a question about, uh, we talked a lot about communicating with people, with um, people under the influence of these populists, and also about how we have difficulty defining our terms. So my context is I'm from Turkey, where I woke up one day and half the country was a terrorist. And in that context, um, it's both important, I think, um, for people to think that human rights is is important in its content, but it's also important that we're talking about the same things when we're talking with them. So for example, when someone says democracy, are they meaning the same thing as we are, where it's not just like a tyranny of majority, but it means something else, protection of minorities and stuff. So I see a huge slide um, in the hallowing out uh, of these words that are super important to us. and create the foundation of the laws that are going to be applied. So if you start calling everyone a terrorist, if you go to the treaty and try to determine if this person has a certain right, the treaty might say no just because you call that person a terrorist. So how, what can we do as human rights activists and academics to uh, make sure that we're all talking about the same thing and address this problem? Well, I'll just say, there is no treaty that says if you call someone a terrorist, then automatically they lose their rights. I know, I know you, I know you weren't saying that, but that's the first thing we say, right? The mere fact that the government has chosen to label someone uh, as a terrorist that doesn't entail the consequences that the government uh, may be one to claim. The government needs to do more than that before it can start limiting and not merely, and before we can start limiting people's rights, and it's not going to be able to strip them of all rights in any case, but even limiting them, it's going to have to do more than apply the label. I said earlier in passing that you know we haven't been able to define terrorism. There are 16 UN treaties that relate to terrorism. They're all derivative of the comprehensive uh, convention Against Terrorism, which has been drafted entirely except for Article 1, which defines what terrorism is. Um, <laughs> you would think that there would be some attention in the legal human rights community to try to figure out why is that and what do you do about it. It's been sitting there for 20 years. Yes, I think we have time for one more question. Hi. Um, so it's been mentioned that social media might be one of the factors that um, have contributed to the advancement of populism and several 
um, jurisdictions. And I would also perhaps include the media more broadly as a phenomenon that has contributed to recent political events. And so my question is, um, from a human rights perspective, what needs to be done um, there? And do we need to reformulate or rethink about our rights to free speech or to engage as citizens? Um, or privacy rights or other types of rights? Or is there something else that we should be thinking about? So there are two quick aspects to that. One is um, that the, uh, I think the rise and the uh, importance of social media has changed both our political discourse, but they've also, it's also undermined traditional media. So one aspect is what can we be doing collectively to make sure that legitimate, that traditional news sources um, don't disappear altogether. Their funding, their business model has been shot you know, through and through, and, and that's a huge problem um, for, a, for a democracy. The second piece has to do with governance of the internet, and there it's a question of some combination of what should, be govern what should governance, governments be doing to constrain what I would call harmful content, and to what extent should the social platforms, the internet platforms, be doing it themselves? Germany just passed a law two months ago which says that hate speech has to be taken down within 24 hours or the companies are fined 50 million euros. Um, that makes me very nervous because other governments are then saying, we're going to have a hate speech law too. There's one in Venezuela now. The Egyptian government just did the same. I worry about government overreach, and we're going to get to a place where what the Iranians called the halal internet, where everybody gets to decide what's halal or kosher. Then we're going to have a balkanized internet, and, and free speech is going to be undermined. On the other hand, the media companies themselves, the internet companies, have been slow to act, and we've been very critical of Facebook, Google, and, and Twitter for not taking greater responsibility they say they're not editors. They're not arbiters of the truth. They're plumbers. They're neither editors of the New York Times nor are they plumbers. They're somewhere in between. And they've got to step up and take greater responsibility or governments are going to create the halal internet. I, I'm standing up to say this has been a long conference and I would like to end it almost on time. Uh, <laughs> I think we've learned a lot. I think we've talked about a lot of very difficult issues. We've had uh, some fruitful disagreements. Uh, we've discussed some things that are very important and that I hope have helped you understand uh, some of these things better. We need to continue to working on these, on these issues in the future. Thank you for your help, and please join me in thanking the panelists for all they've given us.